everybody. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to the Wheeler Centre tonight, tonight and I would like to start proceedings by first of all respectfully acknowledging that we're meeting today in the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders of any communities who may be with us today. So thank you. Um, today our guest is Paul Roos. Really no introduction needed but I'm going to do one anyway. So originally from the aptly named Beverly Hills Football Club. And when, I guess when you come from Beverly Hills, you're destined to be a superstar. Hmm. He played 356 games between 1982 and 1998, first for the mighty Roy Boys, and then to the Sydney, oh, yes. <laughs> and then for the Sydney Swans. In my mind, Paul Roos is one of the greatest defenders to ever play the game. But interestingly, when I was looking up your um, stats today, Paul, 289 goals. Pretty good off the back line. Yeah, I played a bit. Uh, <laughs> I keep led the goal kicking one year at Fitzroy of 49 goals playing centre <laughs> forward. So, and I started as a forward, went back, and then every now and then Parco threw me forward as well. A bit of Parco craziness, or just you just needed to be in the limelight, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more around. Uh, well, the Fitzroy people probably realised after 86 we didn't have a lot of success. I think they were trying anything but then to, to try and win games of footy. Mm -hmm. But also there's so many other accolades. 14 games for Victoria, seven times All-Australian, captain in 91 and 92, a member of the Australian Hall of Fame, Fitzroy's team of the 20th century. And I think for a lot of people in this room, considering the cheer from the, the red and white faithful, ending that 72-year drought an incredible moment for football and obviously an incredible moment for you personally. Yeah, it was, it was amazing to be part of the grand final and I played in the grand final in 1996 and that was a great experience but we got beaten then by the Kangaroos and they were, they were the best team on the, you know, that year and that day and, but to win it in 2005 was just incredible. As the Swans fans know, it was a long period of time and I think walking on the ground, you realised after the game, there was ex-players, ex-administrators, um, current players, current administrators, obviously. But the amount of people that wrote to me after the game, you know, thanking me and the amount of uh, time that it had taken. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, unfortunately, or well, fortunately in one sense, they, a lot of elderly people... Um, finally saw a grand final, but the number of people wrote me letters so I can die happy, so I don't know how many people died after, two, <laughs> after 2005, but there would have been a fair few of them, I think. Mm -hmm. There was some... There was a bit of a fairy tale in both of those grand finals, in a way, wasn't there? Because 96, the Swans weren't expected to challenge either, that you'd come off... The club had come off a really bleak period, and they were the Cinderella team of 96 as well. Yeah, so I went up there in 95 and with Tony Lockett, which was just incredible to have um, Sydney, who were, I think at one stage they went through like a 23-game losing streak in the back of 93, 94, mm -hmm. and then Barras went up there, which made a huge difference to the profile of the, the club. Then at the end of 94, Plugger went up there and I went up there, and then, yeah, probably some of the unsung heroes that went up and played in 96 grand final were Kevin, you know, Kevin Dyson and Craig O'Brien, Stewie Maxfield, who obviously went on to cap captain the Swans, came up, I think, in 96 as well. And then they had some stars, you know, they had Paul Kelly, obviously, they had Darren Creswell, Andrew Dunkley was a fantastic player, Mark Bays. And, yeah, it was a bit of a perfect storm. When I went up there in 95, I must admit, I didn't think I'd play in a final series with the Swans, let alone a grand final. Rodney Ead, you know, took over as coach after Barras set a great platform and for the club. And then to play in the grand final in 96 was just incredible. I hadn't played in one at Fitzroy. We got to the preliminary final in, in 86, which was great. But to play in a grand final was, uh, was just amazing. But, yeah, we, we just fell short and, as I said, got beaten by a better team on the day. Your playing career uh, ended in 1998 and you start your book, here it is, kind of at the end of your playing career, don't you? And the thing is you had been a superstar all your career but that last season you talk about sort of sitting on the bench a lot and um, a different experience of football. How much do you... How important was that to your coaching? Yeah, well, that was incredibly important. Yeah, you know, midway through, you know, 98, I guess you're... you're mind is willing but your body starts to fail you a little bit and I started 
you know, on the bench. Now, back then, the bench was more used when guys got injured or you'd make a, a, an interchange every now and then. So, yeah, it was very different to see it through the eyes of, you know, probably that 20 to, to 25 to 26 player that's not guaranteed a spot every week and not guaranteed to, you know, to get on the ground for long periods of time. And prior to that, you know, I'd been, you know, pretty well picked every single week. And back then, before interchange, you'd play the whole game, et cetera, et cetera. So that last 10 games was fantastic to see the see the game through very, very different eyes. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, the funny thing was, my last game was actually in 1998 and we played in the final against uh, Adelaide at SCG. And obviously I didn't realise it was going to be my last game, but Rodney, it was very good with themes, had a theme about we're all on the train together. And I started on the bench and, and at half time, I was still on the bench and I came in at half time and Rodney's going, you know, we've got to stay on the train, we've got to, you know, all together, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember saying to Stewie Maxfield, I said, mate, I can't get a ticket. You know where, <laughs> I mean, do you know where I'll get a ticket? I'm looking, you know, so Stewie and I were having a bit of a laugh about it at half time. So I actually didn't get on until about 10 minutes into the, to the third quarter and that ended up being my last game. But that, yeah, that 10 week period was, was certainly invaluable in forming a lot of my beliefs around coaching. Did you know that was your last season? Were you... Yeah, I did at the time. Um, I got talked... When I first arrived in Sydney, I signed for three years. So that ended at the end of 97. And I got asked to, to play another year. And then, you know, I knew 98 was going to be my last year, pretty much at the start of 98. That's a theme throughout your career, that you're really honest with when your time is up. In both of your con coaching contracts, as well as your playing, you're very honest, this is it, I'm done. That's not usual for football. Yeah, I think I've always had a, a good perspective on, um, I don't know, the importance of the game. I mean, I've always loved the game, and but I think we can have, get an overinflated opinion of ourselves because it's such a high-profile game, and you know, whether you're coaching or whether you're playing, and I think you can hang on because of the limelight or because of the money you're getting or for the wrong reasons, and, and that never was a focus for me, you know, whether that be the profile of the game or the amount of money I was getting paid. You know, that never defined me as a person. You know, I always wanted to be... Um, I guess true to the footy club, true to myself, and I, I never, you know, ever saw myself as a career coach. You know, I felt that I could help Sydney when I first took over, and I felt that, you know, I, I could do a good job. But you never know when you're a young coach going into coaching. Um, so I felt like I was going to be a good coach, but I actually didn't really know. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd always set myself if I survived that long, seven or eight years was a, a good period to to have a coach and the same group of players together. And that's obviously predicated on success and winning grand finals. So, yeah, I had some, some set views, but, you know, I never really had myself defined as a player or as a coach. You know, you know I was, saw myself as a, as a person first and what I did as a job second. That sort of honesty um, probably led you to sit down at the end of your last game and write what becomes the core of your book, your 25 kind of keys or your 25 ideas around coaching. And they're very different in terms of the traditional role of coaching, education, empowerment, positivity, fun, communication seem to be the core of your values. Uh, I don't know how Barass or a few of the others might have gone with those sorts of things way back in the sort of 60s and 70s. Yeah, the reason I did it, so I sat down in October 1998 when I played my last game and I didn't ever know whether I was going to be a coach. So it wasn't something that I thought, well, I will definitely coach. But it was something I, I always wanted to remember what it was like to be a player and that was really important for me. So I wanted to write them down as a player, what I liked about coaches, what I didn't like about coaches. <laughs> And, like, Parker always jokes to me that all the ones that I didn't like about coach were about him, which is not actually, which is not actually true. Um, but, I, yeah, I put things down honestly. And to be fair, and I try to make it clear in the book, to be fair to Wolsey and Parco and those guys, we were part-time. So, you know, I was going to school, Donvale High School, and then I went to Footscray Institute of Technology, then I was working at the AMP. So we would train at 5 o'clock at night, uh, pre-season training at 6, 6.30 in the morning at Kerford Road. So really, well, you didn't have time to have relationships with your coaches. Wolsey was a school teacher, Parco was a lecturer. Yeah, you know, we'd come down, we'd all get there you know, somewhere between 4.30 and 5, put your clothes on as quick as you could to train, run out and train, um, 
come in, have a quick shower. The best thing about mobile phones is you could order the pizza and pasta on the <laughs> way home. Yeah, it was like 8.30 at night, you'd get your food. You'd, you'd right, I lived by myself you know, since I was about 21 or 22, so you'd sit there by yourself, eat your dinner, and then go to bed. Um, so th then there was this transition to full time, which when I went to Sydney in 95 was the first time I didn't work. So then there was this transition, how do you deal with players that are full time? And that's really why I wrote them down, because if I was going to coach, I didn't ever want to forget what it was like to be coached. And that's why, like one of them, and the people that get the book and read it, there's a whole list of them. And they're not that complicated, you know. They're more around sort of common sense. And one of them is um, players don't mean to make mistakes, you know. But to write that down at the time, I'm sure, I don't, it doesn't matter what team you follow, I'm sure you've seen a player <laughs> kick the ball out of bounds on the fall or kick a point instead of a goal. And I've yet to actually play with a player that's deliberately kicked a point instead of a goal, as, as um, strange as that may sound, because some of the kicking is deplorable. Well, sometimes um, you're sure of it as a fan yeah, sitting on the couch. Or, or like, kick why kick the ball you out of bounds, <laughs> you know, on the fall. So they're really simple things like that mm -hmm. that I really want to... And, they were, look, they were fantastic... I had them on my desk for 11 and a half years, when I, eight and a half years when I was coaching Sydney and the three years that I was coaching Melbourne. And when things weren't going so well, to be able to pick it, pick it out, look at it, reflect on it and know what you know, um, Brett Kirk was going through or Adam Goods or Nathan Jones or Jack Watts or whatever, it was just incredibly valuable. Why do you think they've stood the test of time? Well, I think, I think, and it's interesting, whether, whether you're a, a school teacher or accountant or a football coach, they're relevant to everyone, you know. And I think what happens is when we get in leadership positions, we generally do things out of habit and we do things because, well, that's what my boss did to me, you know. But things change over a period of time. And, and again, it's never a criticism of Parker or Wolsey of any other coaches. Um, but things changed. Um, and I didn't... I wanted to remember what it was like to be a player and I always encourage people when I'm doing leadership talks to write, write them down. When you first walked into your organisation, you know, your first job, what did you like about your managers, your leaders, the CEO, what didn't you like? And I reckon if you're really honest, you're probably doing things now as a leader that you hated, but you do it out of habit yeah, because you forgot to write down what it was like or why you didn't like it. And that was the, the best part about it was to you know, have it there Holding myself accountable was really important because it's fine to get into these jobs of power or leadership or whatever and then completely forget what it's like to be a player. So it held me accountable and that was one of the best things about it. Number one, always remember to enjoy what you're doing. How is that possible in the modern media, in the modern football world that is so scrutinised that there is so much money involved, that there is so much ego involved, that that nothing is kind of secure in some ways. So how do you always enjoy what you're doing? Yeah, and the, and the reason, I guess, uh, maybe putting a context when you read the book, yep. there's, you put some context. So the context around that is we've all seen the coach <laughs> and the grumpy after a game and, I mean, you would have seen him grumpy in the box on the television, so he didn't have to wait till after the game with a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> and then in the rooms after the game, I think as a player you can accept that. You know, you can accept that... We, yeah, we're competitive, players are disappointed, fans are disappointed, but project yourself to Monday morning when you've got to walk in the office, you know, if, you know and if the, if the coach is still negative and grumpy and angry, then what, how are the players going to react? They're going to be negative. Then, then if you're trying to coach players <coughs> and part of the communica is communication, they don't want to talk to you you don't want to talk to them because everyone's angry. You, know, you want players to come into your office. You want players to communicate with you. You want them to talk to you. So you have to, even though you've had a bad loss, you have to make them feel comfortable. And it is a challenge because everyone knows you've lost. It's not like yeah. you can hide it. You know, It's like everyone picks up the paper. Um, but you've got to create that environment that people can get better. And the only way they're going to get better is if you communicate and teach and the only way they can do that is if they want to come and speak to you after a game. So that's a really important part of why I wrote it down. Do you think you took a risk by actually empowering players? That it, for so long it had just been, do as I say, you're playing here, you're <coughs> doing this, 
this is what we've done. I'll tell you who the captain is. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. I mean, when I went into coaching, I must admit, I, I was prepared to take the risk and I knew the consequences. So I knew that if it didn't work, that I wasn't going to coach for very long. But I was prepared to take that risk because I didn't actually want to coach any other way. I didn't, I didn't want to do it another way. And then I felt I wasn't arrogant enough to think this is definitely going to work. I mean, as a young coach coming in, you have doubts. There's no doubt about it. I think we'll touch on some of those doubts <laughs> uh, later on. But So you definitely have doubts around what you do. But I did have this strong conviction that if it didn't work, well, I'll just work away and I'll be proved wrong and I'll go and do something else. So I think there's a big difference between wanting to just hang on because you want to be a senior coach and then you change your philosophies because you love the money, the power, the ego, the, the, the profile, whatever it is. I wanted to do it because I felt like I could do a good job and I had some clear ideas about how to do it. But if it didn't work the way I wanted to do it, I was happy to walk away and go and do something else. You spent some time between playing and coaching back in the United States. You looked at a lot of different organisations. How much did you borrow from those organisations? And when you did decide, OK, we're going to do these things that are quite big in America, was there any resistance? Yeah, so when I retired in 1998, went and lived with Tammy's family in 1999 and I was really fortunate. Triple M contacted me and Channel 7 contacted me. So I had a pretty tough year. I went to the Super Bowl, the Major League Baseball <laughs> All-Star Game, the Davis Cup, the San Francisco 49ers, the Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bulls, Wimbledon, French Open, uh, Mike Tyson's uh, box. So, so I had a pretty tough year in 99. And the media still couldn't keep you there? Yeah. <laughs> well, Gazy was playing with the San Antonio Spurs, so my job was to work out the Channel 7 Bureau and if I had a, an idea, I'd just ring up the Channel 7 Bureau and say, look, can we do this? Dave Nilsson was playing the first Australian ever to play in the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. So I rang up and said, can I go there? They said, that's a great idea. So that was a good <laughs> idea. Um, Gazy was playing in San Antonio. So I said, well, look, why don't we do a story on Gazy? They said, that's a good idea. Davis Club were playing in Boston. They said, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, the Super Bowl was in Miami. That was a good idea. Mike Tyson was fighting Francois Botha. So there wasn't a lot of resistance to the stories. <laughs> uh, but, but part of the journey was yeah, going to some of the great... Um, clubs over there because, I mean, they've been full-time, I don't know, the NBA and the NFL have been full-time since, I guess, the 60s or 70s, I'm not 100% certain. So we were just transitioning into this full-time environment, you know, really in the late 90s. So when I went over there, I mean, the Chicago Bears, for instance, had an $80 million, you know, training facility. <laughs> uh, they had a full-size indoor uh, training ground, two full-size outdoor training grounds, one had heaters underneath the ground in case it snowed, so the heat, so the snow could melt. In the indoor venue, they had cameras either end of the uh, ground and cameras on the side of the ground, and they would send the the footage of the training back into the um, straight into their IT department. So that was one thing that I picked up was how well they trained and how they educated their players through training. Yeah, you know, going and watching the 49ers train, it was like military precision watching how they actually structured their training. So, yeah, some of the things that I really learned then, and it relates probably to 2005 with the Nick Davis goal, <laughs> was, you know, you have to train the way you're going to play and then you, you know, you, you, we videotaped training. We didn't have $80 million. We got a cherry picker where we... <laughs> So we had their, their IT guy with a camera with a cherry picker, so he stood on the top like this, and on the windy days he shit himself most of the time. So, <laughs> um, but he stood up there brave, bravely, which was fantastic. So ours quite, wasn't quite as high tech. But then what we did is we started to show the players before training, you know, every training session, what they... So you weren't then educating just around the games. You were able to educate, you know, pre-season. So that model was fantastic. And then the notion of practising, you know, 30-second drills, 10 seconds to go in a game, one point up, one point down, all those. So they really came from a time in, in America. So it was, you know, back then it was, you know, incredibly valuable and very progressive. The groundswell from Sydney supporters, from the Swan supporters, to to back you for the job after you'd held it as a an interim position, did that give you faith? Yeah, it did. I mean, so I took over midway through two thousand and two, um, and I mean, it was quite interesting the first part of it because. Yeah, you know, the media in some ways have changed a lot, in other ways it hasn't. So we, for those Swan supporters that might remember the game, was halfway through 2002. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we were about four goals up against Geelong. Rodney was coaching. I think they kicked the last five goals in about 10 minutes. And then pandemonium just took over. You, you know you're in trouble as a club when the the board and the CEO beat you down the change rooms after the game. So they're actually in the rooms um, waiting. waiting for the players. So that's... Anyone that's involved in the footy club, that's a bad sign. <laughs> um, so there's a little bit of a warning for Koshy after what he, <laughs> after what he said. It's not a great sign, Koshy. Um, so they all got in. Kelvin Templeton was the CEO. And what I've made clear in the book, everyone was well-meaning. So mm -hmm. no one wants to be at a footy club and not have that footy club be successful. But when it starts to get really fractured, you can tell. I mean, I was involved in Fitzroy and involved in Sydney at that time. You can really – you can see those sort of signs, you know, and – Everyone wanted the team to win and everyone was in was making suggestions that were admirable, but Kelvin Templeton wanted us to come back and play a practice game the next day, mm -hmm. like a Sunday morning. We'd just finished playing that night. He wanted us to come back and play a, a full-scale practice game. And I remember being in the rooms going, nothing good's going to come out of this meeting. This is, this is not great. Anyway, Rocket sort of got talked into it. And I don't think he really believed it as well, but he got talked into bringing the players back the next day. Um... The, we had a buy the following week, so some of the players had already organised flights. Um, we had a function that night, and I remember two or three of the players, who I won't name, they were going to boycott the next day's training session. I was an assistant coach. I said, guys, you can't do that. That's just going to be a massive story. It'll destroy the footy club. So I eventually talked them into making sure they turned up. They turned up the next day. And then the second bad sign was the scarecrow, and anyone that's mm. um, I, I don't know what's in the book, but you do mention uh, yeah, scarecrow. So the scarecrow is when you hold your arms out like this, and you've got to actually hold them there until you they you know, basically drop. Now players are very competitive, and what tends to happen the knees start to go to the ground first, then the the, the torso starts to follow, so they end up pretty much lying on the ground face down with their arms still up in the air. And I remember Wolsey did it at Fitzroy a couple of times and I always say nothing good comes from the scarecrow. Um, so they did that and I'm watching this going, this is not, not going to end well. So the next day or a couple of days later, I got a phone call and again, this is where the media comes. I got a phone call from um, Stephen Quartermain from Channel 10. He said, oh, I heard Rodney Eads going to resign. I said, and my office was right next to Rockets. I said, no, nah, mate, no, no. Nah. He, he said, well, I'm pretty sure he is. Then John Blakey, who's an ex-teammate of mine and working for Brisbane at the time, rang me about 10 minutes later and said, oh, geez, that's pretty sad about Rocket. He's resigning. I said, no, he's not. So then I got up out of my chair and I walked into Rocket's office and I said, mate, I've just had two phone calls telling me you're going to give it away. He said, yeah, I am. So I actually found out I, my desk was next to his or office and I found out externally. Um, and then it was a matter of... You know, what, who was going to do it? Then they asked me to do it for the rest of the year. Um, and we won sort of six of the last ten. And the last game of that year was Paul Kelly and Andrew Dunkley's last game, which was, which was huge. Um, and then there was sort of the rumour around Terry Wallace getting the job. No, it was, and yeah, so it was, Yeah, it was a, sort of a, an interesting time. But one of the things which hopefully people will, look, will enjoy when they get the book, which I did... So I had to do a presentation to the mm -hmm. Swans board... Um, at the end of that year, 2002. And I put together this um, big PowerPoint with a really good friend of mine, Anthony Carl, and an external ad um, advisor. Um, and then we presented it to the board. It took about three or four hours. I didn't actually know it still existed. I, I rang um, Carly when I started doing the book and he had a copy of it. So it's never, ever been seen before. I hadn't seen it for <laughs> so long and it's it's in all the in the book. So it's, it's so good looking back on... <laughs> what we sort of set out to do and what obviously end up transpiring, you know, over the next sort of eight and a half years. But it's fascinating for me even to look back on, on that to, to, to see what, uh, what we put on, what we put it down on paper at that time. Through the book, you, you have a different idea of what success is from most football clubs. You're, you measure it differently. Yet in that presentation, you do promise the premiership. Was yeah, it a, it was, was it a rush of blood? I uh, don't know. It, it <laughs> might have been, you know, you're trying to sell yourself. But, yeah, and the, one of the things I think, I think I will inspire, teach and deliver mm. a premiership to the Sydney Swans. So it actually worked out pretty well in the <laughs> end. Um, but when I wrote in 2002, <laughs> it was a bit of a leap of faith. Um, no, look, I, I guess what I've always tried to be is process-driven. I think, you know, one of the things I'm really strong on after so long in football, if you can get the process right, mm -hmm. you know, everything looks after itself. You know, and if you define success 
as just winning a premiership than it means, well, now, it means 17 teams aren't successful. And I never really subscribe to that. You know, I think, you know, if you, if you, if you have a really strong platform and you have a great um, bunch of people involved and you have a good plan, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen in a grand final. I don't have to tell the, the Swans people, you know, if Leo Barry drops that mark, you know, it might have been crumbed by the West Coast. They kicked the goal. The Fitzroy people in the rooms, everyone remember 83? Uh, when Mickey Nettlefold ran the ball over the boundary line, you know, Michael <laughs> Tuck kicks a winning goal. So there's things in a game you can't really control. You know, there are probably not any port supporters in the room, but like no. Luke Shuey gets a free kick at the end <laughs> of that game. If, if there's ever an indication of how random sometimes a game can be, you know, that, that's, um, despite what the AFL said, under the rules, that's not a free kick. The rule states that it's actually not a free kick. Now, I'm not criticising the umpires, but what I'm saying is that's not a free kick. Now, clearly the umpire at, in real time, you know, saw that it was a head-eye tackle and made the decision that I think we all support, but under the rule. So that's how random the game can become. So you can't, as frustrating as it is, one of, the, I guess, the great things about... Well, one of the hardest things about being a leader or a coach is to try and take the emotion out of it and really tr always try and stick to a, a process, a game plan, a set of behaviours mm. or 25 points or whatever they are. You tried to take some of that randomness out of the game, didn't you, by training for set plays? And it doesn't work better... It, there's no better example of it, I should say, than that Nick Davis goal. And for some people may have been in this room 12 months ago when I interviewed Bomber Thompson here on this same stage your opposing coach on that day. And as I was reading your book, I thought, I've read this before. And I went back and I grabbed Bomber's book and you both talk about that 10 seconds of football and almost word for word in some ways because you're watching exactly the same matchups, but you're calm. You know everything you want to happen is happening and Bomber is tearing his hair out and you can read it through the words. So how does 10 seconds create destiny? Yeah, look, I think if, if I had to take, you know, one piece of vision from my whole coaching career that, you know, talks about empowerment and why you, you know, have leadership groups and why you have standards and behaviours and why I went to America or went to those places and looked at them, why you train things, it would be that, you know, that 25 seconds because, yeah, everything we do as a, as a footy coach is to win games of footy. So I don't empower players just because I don't want to turn up to work or something <laughs> like that, you know. You actually are empowering players because you think it'll work at the end of the day and you think they will embrace it and you think that, you know, in those key moments they will take ownership of their footy club and they will say, no, the, we, we want to win and this is how we win. So if you were to take sort of 30 seconds, but it just, it was, and I know Bomber because, not that we'd ever spoken about it, but I knew someone that was on that coaching panel and said that, yeah, Bomber used to go to leadership talks and talk, show that piece of vision and say this is how not to do it. And mm -hmm. I used to, you know, in all seriousness, I used to go to leadership talks and show that piece of vision and, and talk about it. Because it's fine for me, you know, to empower players and, and have good leaders, but it's all about acting it on the field. And if you see the way, you know, Leo Barry started it, uh, not that I can remember it very vividly, but Leo Barry started it, third man up, which we'd practised. He hit the ball going forward. Luke Ablett knocked the ball back in. It was going to go out of bounds. Barry Hall then knocked the ball back in. It was going to go out of bounds. You know, Ryan O'Keefe tried to, to take it at the top of the square. Yeah, there was a, there was a, a ball up. And then you, Jason Ball, who's one of our leaders, was telling everyone to move out of the way. Ty Canelli, who was playing half backs, was standing on the goal line because he knew that if his opponent, you know, was... If he was standing outside the 50 as a defender, his opponent would have stood in the hole. So he took his man in. Yeah, Brett Kirk was took his place. All the midfielders spread out. Adam Schneider blocked for Nick Davis. Jason Ball hit the ball right where it's supposed to be. And then Nick Davis kicked an unbelievable goal. So we practised it over and over and over again. But they had to... The, this notion of empowerment and leadership means that they have to do it in real time, under pressure, mm -hmm. under fatigue, at the end of a game with, with their whole season on the line. So in his book, Bomber says that they called, they had a similar tactic and they called it the Blitz. Yep. And part of the Blitz was beware of the Blitz, that yeah. another club might do this to you. So they're aware of it. They know this could happen. 
So why do their players follow your players out? And that's the whole notion because you've got to, and I don't know how much Bomber practice it, but you are relying on the players. Mm -hmm. But if you don't empower them and if you don't teach them to lead and put them in situations, then they can't actually reproduce it in real time because they're all tired, they're all fatigued, you know, and it only takes one person to do the wrong thing. You need 18 players to be able to do it. So it's not actually easy to do, but the players have to really embrace it. Um, but we, I mean, that was a result of three years of practice, really, doing that drill over and over and over and over again, and then, you know, the team meetings, the, the leadership meetings, you know, the players, Shuey Maxfield driving the standards for three years. So, yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens over a long period of time. But you had to change that culture, didn't you? You had to change the culture of the Swans. You brought in leading teams. You let the, pl you let the players have a lot of say over that. They then embraced the Bloods, which is part of the South Melbourne uh, culture and history. How hard is it to change culture at a football club? Yeah, look, I mean, to be fair, we, we did have a bit of success before I took mm -hmm. there. So Melbourne was very different, and maybe, yeah. we'll, maybe we'll touch yep. on Melbourne mm -hmm. in terms of that. But we had some success. It was probably the Swans was more around the empowerment, more around the leadership. You're getting players more and more involved. And also the blood thing was really important. You know, I think, yeah, we had a, at that stage, we had a group of players that, you know, were pretty fortunate. They'd come to a really good football club. Yeah, they were really well looked after. For those of you Swans fans remember in 81, I think it was, when they relocated the club. I mean, these guys got phone books and basically said, well, find a place to live, find a place to put your kids in school. You know, so it was, it was a massive upheaval heaval of South Melbourne. And also, you know, the history is very grand of South Melbourne. So once we established um, with leading teams, with Ray McLean, once we established what we're going to do, empower the players, what the behaviour is going to be... Um, you know, someone said in the, one of the team meetings, you know, why don't we call ourselves the Bloods? And we put this video together. You know, I put this video together with the coaches and we had Bobby Skilton talk and Paul Kelly and Barry Round. And we really wanted to explain to this young group of players about the history of South Melbourne and how much they did before us and how the sacrifice they made. And I think it really resonated with our current group of players and then it brought everyone back together as a footy club and obviously 2005 was a, the sort of culmination of that. Do you think embracing that history was really important to changing the fortunes of that club? Yeah, no doubt. I, I think being in Sydney has its benefits. You know, being in Sydney was, was good from an anonymity point of view and I guess not as much media scrutiny and players... Um, yeah, getting away from the club. But I always I felt that, and this, the Sydney Swans without South Melbourne didn't have that real heart and soul, you know. So to connect the Sydney Swans, and they are one club, but, but you know, trying to make that connection mm -hmm. was really important. And once we made that connection and once the players firmly understood the history of the footy club... I think it really changed the players' mindset. I think they were playing for more than just themselves or more than than Sydney. And, I, and, and all of them loved Sydney, and Sydney obviously embraced the Swans. But I think it became a real strength. We had, two, I think the banner on grand final day said... Uh, one club, two cities. Yeah, one club, two cities. I think not only did the players embrace it, I think the fans in yep. Melbourne that are here, probably some of them are here, started to really sense that yep. the players were now playing for this entity that was South Melbourne turned into Sydney rather than a reluctant team that got relocated. It was just a, It's just a little thing, but when you ran out onto the ground in 96, you ran out to the up there gazelle type thing that was became the Swans theme song for a bit there. You run out in 2005 and it's back to that great theme song, Cheer, Cheer. And I know my dad actually barracks for the Swans and, you know, all his life. He said that as a Melbourne supporter, he felt a bit disconnected by yeah. cheer, uh, by the other song. So it was just bringing that back that seemed to really reconnect the whole club. Yeah, I think the fans could sense it. I think the fans could sense, yeah, that we really made a great effort. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, we brought up some and made life membership. Peter Bedford, I think, might have been the first one that came up. And then uh, Barry Mitchell, I remember coming up. He was very emotional when he got his life membership. So I think there were some really key moments in the footy club to really connect the history. But it meant a huge amount to the players because 
I think they'd gone from you know, a young group that had been sent to Sydney in a little bit of still unfamiliar territory. I mean, we're quite popular by then, thanks to Plugger and playing the grand final in 96. And, you know, obviously there was a, a bit of a history before that with, you know, Jared Healy, Brownlow medalist and Diesel and Dennis Carroll, great captain. But I think the connection really started to take place once we we really made the connection visibly to the players. This is what happened. We showed them vision of, you know, some of the... You know, the old black and white vision, we showed a vision of Bobby Skilton. We had Bobby come up, Barry Round, you know, some of these. So we made the connection. I think the fans felt that as well. Did you feel that 2005 was destined, that everything was falling into place up until grand final day? Yeah, it was hard to tell. I mean, I think, um, you know, things really turned around, ironically, we, when we played um, West Coast early on and, and Andrew Demetrio criticised yeah. us and said we'd, we're never going to win many games playing that <laughs> style of footy. And I think in some ways it was a bit of a catalyst for the players to make a commitment to play as a team. And again, a touch on the book. And they became very selfless. And there are, there are moments in the season where you can sort of sense, geez, they're really starting to get it. You know, they're really starting to understand this notion of team and playing my role and, and not worrying about whether I'm the best player or the 15th best player or whatever. Um, but once you get the finals, I mean, anything can happen. You know, we lost the first final and then we were about four goals down in a low-scoring game at, at, um, at the SCG against Geelong. And then it's funny because, I mean, Davo tells the story better, but Davo's man kicked a goal to put them four goals up. And Brett Kirk, I remember, just grabbed him and shook him and said... Yeah, you owe us one, and Dave tells the story. He said, "I, you know, you owe me one, so I gave him four, you know, <laughs> um, and won the game. But it was best quarter finals footy I've ever seen from Dave. You know, just to turn the game around. We played really well the next week against um, uh, St Kilda, kicked seven in the first, I think six in the last, and, and it wasn't without its controversy that day either, was it? Barry oh, with Hall. Barry Hall, yeah, with Barry Hall, um, with Maguire. And then, yeah, I think we were ready to win a grand final, you know, and nothing's ever certain. But I said to the players on the Friday night, and Wisher might have said the same thing, but I genuinely believed if we had played the way we played and committed to each other, you know, I guaranteed the players we would win the next day. And I think they needed to hear that because when you get to grand finals, yeah, you, 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 do we have to play a bit differently? Do I have to do a bit more? You know, what's Kirky thinking? So I think to reassure the players, just play the way you played, and if we do that for 120 minutes, we'll win the game. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it's easy to look back now and say, yeah, I thought we were going to win it, but <laughs> not until Leo Barry marked it. Well, we didn't even see the mark, but and then Peter Jonas yelled out, "The sirens go on." That's probably when I knew we were going to win it. I was fortunate to be in the rooms that afternoon, and I've been very lucky in my career to be in the winning rooms on a number of times, but I've never ever experienced anything like that. That day was quite incredible. The emotion, the embracing of the fans. Why do you think the Swan? Uh, the other great grand final to be in the rooms was 2012. The Swans again. What What is it about the club that makes it so embracing? Do you think? Yeah, I always again. I always talk about. I mean, people make up a footy club. You know, pe people are the club. We don't have a product. You know, we don't sell shoes like Nike or. <laughs> you know, sell real estate. Our product is people. And if you get good people, it's amazing how good things happen, you know. And I think that club, you know, certainly when, when I was there, you know, really good people. Um, I always talk about egos destroying footy clubs. Egos destroy football clubs. You know, we had guys that were there for the right reason, whether that were players, assistant coaches, you know, Andrew Island, Richard Collis. Yeah, they were all there for the right reason. They didn't. Their egos didn't get in the mm -hmm. way. And I think what you saw on... Um, after the game was not people tripping over themselves to try and get publicity for themselves to say I was more important than that guy or gee how good was I today I think it was just the culmination of everyone understanding how much work went into 72 years of and it wasn't just that day it wasn't just those people in that room it was actually acknowledgement of how many people went before us I think that was just as a result of the great people. And even in that moment, no one was clamouring for this extra coverage of, mm. or look at me, this is what I did. It was an acknowledgement of, of everything that had happened for 72 years and then everything that happened in 2005 and just the sheer excitement of this collective group of people you know, winning a premiership that it had taken so long to do. Do you think that's why the Swans have been able to sustain success for such a long time? You've... 
Um, other clubs are happy, it seems, to go to the bottom of the ladder and grab early draft picks, but you, in the book, you talk about the draft not being the be-all and end-all of success. You also basically reject the idea and the notion of premiership windows, which everybody else sets their clock by. Why do you think those two things aren't as important as other people think they are? Yeah, it's funny. I think the Swans people would probably still be sitting up there thinking, how do we get away with this for so long? <laughs> you know, it's it's quite amazing when I look at what we created and John Longmire was there, and I say we because it wasn't just me. It was Stewie Maxfield and Brett Kirk and, you know, John Blakey, Ross Lyon, uh, Peter Jonas, Steve Malaxos, George Stone. But I, still, I guarantee Sydney probably still look up and say, how do we keep getting away with this? Um, yeah, my view on Premiership Windows is complete garbage, you know, and if anyone can show me this blueprint how to win a Premiership by going to the bottom of the ladder, um, I haven't seen it happen yet. I mean, what you are obligated to do as a coach is pick the best team every week to play and at the end of every year is to pick the best list for the next year. Mm -hmm. That's purely and simply what you're employed to do. Um, and I think what Sydney have done... Um, and what we tried to create at Melbourne was was exactly that. And I think Hawthorne have done it pretty well and Geelong have done it pretty well. And that's saying, OK, well, we've got players that are coming towards the end of their careers. What do we need? How do we need to replace them? And it doesn't matter whether the guy is 25 or 23 or 18, if he's the best player to... to if you believed in premiership windows, then Hawthorne wouldn't have won a premiership in 08. Sydney wouldn't have won one in 25, 212. Mm -hmm. Bulldogs wouldn't have won one last year. So it's the teams that challenge this ridiculous notion of premiership windows. And also, I mean, I'm, you know, I've been pretty frank on my assessment. You're talking about 18-year-old kids coming into your yeah. footy club. Yeah, the number one draft pick's going to be 18. The number... If you finish on the bottom now, the second pick that you get is, at best is pick 19. Yeah, it used to be obviously one and, and pick 13, but that's the, the best. If if there's free agents, the free agents get slotted in, you know, back end of the first round. So you probably get pick one and maybe pick 24. That's going to make very little difference to your footy club in, a sh in the short term. So... It, it was a huge advantage for Sydney. I think teams have started to wake up and mm -hmm. up to it a bit more now. But again, I think following on from what I said earlier, it's about process. If you get the process right, you know, then you, everything looks after itself. If you don't get the process right, it doesn't matter whether you finish bottom, top or, or middle, you're eventually going to start going backwards. When you went to Melbourne, um, did you become even more wedded to that idea because that was a club that had actually been ravaged by chasing draft picks. Oh, going to Melbourne was fantastic. I mean, it was very hard because, you know, we'd won two games and lost 20 the year before I started and the percentage was 54. So I think it was the worst percentage, uh, fifth worst season in the history of the AFL. But, yeah, really when I, when I left there after three years, it just reinforced the views that I, mm. I picked up through Fitzroy, th coaching Sydney... And I still have exactly the same views. You know, you've got to get good quality coaches in, good CEO, good football manager, good chairman. Glenn Bartlett's done an outstanding job. Peter Jackson's done an outstanding job. Josh Marnie, Todd Viney, who's the list manager. It's not just about appointing a coach. It's about getting the whole organisation right, getting good behaviours for your players, getting good role models. Bernie Vince coming in, Daniel Cross coming in was imperative because they didn't actually have great role models because mm. they tipped out Brad Miller and Brent... You know, um, Brad Green and um, um, McD Alex McDonald, a lot of other guys, you know, when they probably should have stayed on. Um, and then they just thought, well, if we go down the bottom of the ladder, we'll get all these early mm -hmm. draft picks and eventually they'll play a certain amount of games and we'll win. That that didn't work that well with all the Melbourne supporters, did it, in the room? But that was a um, culture you did have to change, wasn't it? Because yeah, it was, you yeah. know, and I, definitely. You know, it was really just getting the players that we thought were going to help the club and, and getting the set of standards of behaviours, the succession plan was really important. But building the foundation of the football club, that when these players came in, they were taught how to play the right way. Um, I think probably one of the best text messages I got last year was from Jared McVeigh, you know, and he texted me after my last game from, from Melbourne and he said, thanks, Rusey, for teaching us the right way to play. You know, so that was 
one of the best messages that I ever got from a from a player. And he was an early draft pick, and we wouldn't pick him for probably you know, 12 months, two years, and he struggled to get a game early. He got frustrated, didn't play in the grand final in 05, I think played in the losing one in 06 from memory, and eventually played in the premiership in 2012 and became captain of the football club. Um, yeah, so I've got some very strong beliefs on how footy should be played and how footy clubs should be, you know, administered and, and managed. You say that the Melbourne job became uh, more enticing the worse it became. That's your comment in the book. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Peter <laughs> Jackson painted a pretty bleak picture, so he didn't sort of... He certainly didn't paint a rosy picture no. of how the footy club was. But I, I admired that with Peter because he, you know... And, and going in, we were really clear on... Um, you know, how the footy club was, you know, and, and I had to bring in, you know, I didn't have time to coach coaches. So the guys like Benny Matthews, Jade Rawlings, Brett Allison, Daniel McPherson, Georgie Stone were so good coming into that footy club, you know, knowing that, that you know, I knew they were great coaches, I knew they could d educate the players, but equally I knew it was going to take time and I know the Melbourne supporters are still probably a little bit frustrated from the Collingwood game in round 23. Um, but if where you look, they've come from... They won 12 games. They improved by two games again this year. Had a lot of injuries to Viney, Hogan, you know, Nathan Jones. You know, and, and I don't normally make guarantees, but I guarantee they'll make the finals next year. Now, that's when I say that, it's all based on injuries. But they're mm -hmm. definitely... There's no more excuses for Melbourne. I think this year was still a little bit of an unknown mm -hmm. with how young they are. Next year, there's no excuses. They'll, they'll definitely play finals next year. One of the sad things in the book is when Jack Watts says to you, I just want to be treated like a human being. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty confronting. You know, we met with the leadership group. Well, I met with the leadership group before I decided to take the job and they were really honest. I mean, they took responsibility, as I mentioned in mm -hmm. the book, and they were really honest about how the role they played and felt that they let you know, their coaches down and hadn't done as well as they should have. And But I implored them. They didn't know me at the time. And I said, look, I want you to be really honest. And when Watsy said that, it was... Yeah, it was pretty tough to hear that. Um, and then I got some text messages from Nathan Jones and Jack Viney and um, Jack Grimes, Jack Trengove, a few of the others. Um, what's he? So, yeah, I, I felt like the biggest part of what we did in the first 12 months was build relationships, try and be positive with players. The 20, mm -hmm. Going back to those 25 points, you know, about how we could build these players up over the first 12 months, and that was really, really important. But you talk about them almost having... that they've got that they've suffered from trauma, that things had been so bad for them. So how do you go from trauma to fun? Yeah, well, you had to create a, a good environment, you know, and, and I remember <laughs> it was pretty hard because we lost the first game against St Kilda and then we got beaten by 98 points against West Coast in the second game. And then the third game we played the Giants at um, uh, their home ground. And I remember Nathan Jones said to me in the corridor, on the Monday, Tuesday, I said, we're shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Jonesy, I'm not going anywhere. Don't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. So, yeah, look, they were. It was hard. It was... If players... You know, sometimes fans think players don't care. I mean, the players are just so invested in their footy club. There's no one, I guarantee, no one cares more than the coaches and the players. They're not mm -hmm. the most fanatical supporter in the world. They, this is their job. This is what... They go to work every single day. Mm -hmm. So, these players... Yeah, losing for six or seven years was hard. So it's hard not to take that on board, getting booed off the field. It's hard not to take it personally. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we dealt with it. We confronted it. We spoke about it. I remember getting you know, nine or ten of those players in every week after games and we talked about it. How did you feel? And they were really honest. So we worked really hard on the mental side of the, of the game. Um, and did an enormous amount of work on that. You say that, uh, you know, you did say that the worse that they sold the job, the more appealing it got. So, uh, Gold Coast. <laughs> well, again, I, <laughs> look, see, I mean, seeing Melbourne, and I, and I love watching them play now because I see how far. And as I said, it's not, I think there's this misconception that if you just employ a person, whether that's you know, employing a, a new CEO or a new football manager, whatever. It's a collective, yeah, and, and, and I've been asked about coaching. But my advice to any coach that's going, and I've said this to a couple that have asked me, you have to know who you're going to bring with you. And if I'm employing a coach, if I'm on the Gold Coast board, I'm not, I'm, I'm saying to their, I've said, well, tell me who you're going to bring with me. Mm -hmm. Tell me who, who you're going to bring. I don't want to know whether, okay, we're going to give you the job, but you need to tell me 
what you want from a list manager, who your assistant coach is going to be, who's your development coach going to be. That's Because it's not as simple as just saying to this coach, we'll come and coach the club. And we've mm -hmm. seen it. You know, how many times has it failed? Because, in my opinion, the people that employ the coaches have no idea. So it's pretty hard to get it right mm -hmm. if they don't really know what they're looking for and they don't really know you know, how they're going to go about this process. So if it's me appointing the coach, I want to know what this coach is going to bring with them. And, and I want to know their whole philosophy around coaching and what their coaching staff is. Paul, uh, John, um, if, uh, it's been great listening to you, but if I could uh, take you a, le a little bit further back as a, as a person who's grown up as a Fitzroy, uh, Fitzroy person, um, just if you could relate... Um, there was a the number you wore, Fitzroy number one, and the guy that immortalised that before you, Kevin Murray. And I just wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that, uh, taking that jumper on when you first started um, in '82, and what you know, and perhaps into the into that Fitzroy era around that '83, as you said, which was uh, just a, a smidge, smidgen away from winning a grand final. Yeah, so when I arrived at Fitzroy, I, I was in the zone, so I lived out in Donvale and actually I went to the Beverly Hills Junior Footy Club 50-year anniversary on Saturday night, which was a fantastic night. So I was zoned to Fitzroy, went down there as a kid, played down the 19s, and then I, all of a sudden I turned up, <clears throat> got on the senior list, I think it was in 81. So I go to the... To the I think it was a Leonda or some, something like that. So I go to the jumper presentation night, mum and dad are there, um, and I'm sitting there waiting, waiting for my jumper, waiting for my jumper, waiting for my jumper, and I thought, maybe actually I'm not on the list because <laughs> they you know, go down from number... And back then there was like 60-something players on the list, so they started like 65 years. So it's your first year on the list, and generally mm -hmm. you start with... I mean, if you can get 50, you're doing pretty well <laughs> on the first. So I'm thinking 50, 49, 48, 47, it just keeps going down and down. I'm going, shit, this is going to be embarrassing <laughs> because... I brought mum and dad along and I, like, so I don't think I made the list this year. Um, and then all of a sudden they came to number one and they called my name out and I thought they made a blue because um, I'd never played a senior game. So it was quite unusual. And then you mentioned the great Kevin Murray and, I mean, what a, an absolute gentleman. Yeah, you know, I've been fortunate to be involved in footy for, you know, the best part now of uh, 35 years or whatever it is. Yeah, to meet guys like Kevin Murray, Bobby Skilton, EJ Witten was one of my favourite people playing State of Origin footy with, with EJ. Just great, great footballers. But the common theme is just they're great people. You know, Kevin Murray, um, you know, I can't speak highly enough. And when you when you go to a function, even now, and Muzz is there and just puts a smile on your face. I got a photo with him a couple of... Or last year, I think it was, at the Junction Oval when they finally decided, I think they weren't going to play any more football there and just to see Muzzer again. But... You know, I touch on it in the book as well. I was so lucky to go to Fitzroy. They, they're unbelievable role models, you know. And I was a 17-year-old kid, you know, still going to high school. Laurie Serafini, Bernie Quinlan, Gary Wilson, Rossi Thornton, Leon Harris. You know, the list goes on and on and on. They're, they're incredibly great, good role models. Still, you know, great friends. I got a, a text from the other day from Mickey Conlon, who's in Seoul, and said, oh, mate, I just, you know, saw you brought out a new book, mate. Congratulations. And that's sort of the, the connection that exists between all those Fitzroy players because they're just such great people and I was so lucky. And a lot of those things that I learnt and implemented as a player and a coach, I learnt from all those players. Why didn't Fitzroy work? Why, you know, it was, as you say, you constantly in the book refer to the, the greatness of the people there. What happened? I think, unfortunately, we, if, I think if we won the Premiership in 83, it would have been a little bit similar to Hawthorne. Those of you who remember Hawthorne were going to merge with Melbourne and got through that period. And then, you know, all those young kids that started following them in 83, what is it, 83, 84, you know, 86, 89, all of a sudden they started to become paid members. Mm. We probably just missed out on that group because we didn't win the flag in 83. We played 83, 84, 86. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of went downhill. And, and back then... Yeah, we were going to merge with the Bulldogs and then they raised money and we sort of got it left out on the limb again. It was pride, just pride. Like, it wouldn't happen now because the AFL, with the TV rights, nine games a weekend, 18 teams. So we really just missed that boat mm -hmm. um, a little bit. And unlike Sydney, I think we probably should have gone to you know, Brisbane at the end of 86. 
you know, and we would have had a lot of success then, mm -hmm. and, you know, that connection. But thankfully, you know, there are a lot of, you know, I was, I was at the grand final in 2001, working for Channel 7, when Lynchy and the Brisbane Lions won the Premiership. And there's still a lot of people that still follow the club and were really pleased that day. Do you have but any I, affinity to the Brisbane Lions? Do you oh, feel look, anything? I've always been a, I'm a Fitzroy player, played 200, you know, 69 games with them and captain the club. So I always consider my history is with Fitzroy and Fitzroy merged with Brisbane. Um, but we, you tend to move, you know, then I coached Sydney and played mm. at Sydney and then I was coached Melbourne. Uh, but I always have a history there and I love going back and seeing the Kevin Murray and Laurie Serafini, his great friends, and I run into Gary Wilson all the time in Port Melbourne. So there's always a strong connection there, absolutely. G'day, Paul. Great to hear you uh, talking tonight. I'm a big fan. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, player salaries. We're seeing now more and more offers over a million dollars, which still is rather unusual. But when a player like Buddy Franklin goes into Sydney's culture on that type of money, <clears throat> how does a coach sort of bring the players around him? Because, I mean, when he got there, obviously, he was quite disruptive and now he's much different. But that sort of money must play on the players' minds a little. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, it's funny because I honestly believe players never really worry too much about other, what other players get paid. It's interesting, when I was playing, it took about the money when I was 86, when I finished second in the Brownlow medal. Someone asked me this the other day, I made $52,000 that year, and I was pretty, I was not a bad player. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was good money back then. But even then, like, there was always players coming into your club that, I remember Johnny Einmunger came from Sydney, uh, Sydney to Fitzroy, and he was getting paid more than me. And I didn't, it didn't sort of worry me, because I think players honestly believe, which they do, they all, everyone has a chance to, to negotiate your contract, you know, and it's free market in a sense. Um, so it's more around, and I'm not saying this about Buddy, but I'm saying it's more around the personality of the player. That's that's what I found. So players are more concerned when a player comes in. That, and, and I always asked the Swans players when I was coaching, as I did with the Melbourne players, do you want this player to come in? And they never really worried about the money side of it, but they would always say, there was a player that, we, that I asked the Swans players when I was coaching, I won't mention the player's name, but I went to the leadership group and said, look, what do you think? And they said, nah, we definitely don't want that player. So not necessarily money, but definitely around behaviours and person. And again, the money side, you're referring to Buddy, I'm not, I don't know Buddy at all well enough to comment on the personality side. What I'm saying in a general sense, players definitely worry about personalities, character, how that's going to fit in, and generally don't worry too much about the, the money side of it because they all get a chance to negotiate their own contracts. Were you shocked when they when the player in the leader group said no to a player? Uh, no, because I probably would have said no to <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that didn't shock me. Okay. I was just getting reinforced by the, okay. by the players. Next question, please. Good evening, Paul. Uh, there are at least two port supporters here in the audience tonight. Oh. <laughs> um, just on what happened on Saturday, which is interesting, and particularly in what you'd said about your preparations and what the drills that you did, uh, the omen was there at half time when Shuey had the kick out for the siren and missed. The kick that he took, or the free kick that he got, it wasn't that 20 seconds. The, the, that's, the seeds of that were all sown way before then. That was just the way it happened at that point in time. And to hear David Koch lambast the players for what, you know, for what happened and saying that, uh, that if you don't want to be part of the club, get out. You know, I was just aga aghast at the time after having been an old Port player myself. Yeah, you were saying about what David Koch said? Yes. Yeah. yeah, look, I think... <laughs> look, to be fair to David, I wasn't there, but if it's reported the way that it, it has been and he went in and spoke to the players after the game, that's not his role, you know. And Keith Thomas, who's a good mate of mine... Um, we had a great saying at Sydney, which we transferred to Melbourne, know your role, play your role. Now, whether that's the boot starter, the captain, the, the chairman, the CEO, he should never walk in that change rooms after a devastating loss. One of the things in the book, which, which is there, is, and I wrote this down, um, never fly off the handle after mm -hmm. a game. If too emotional, don't say something to Monday. Someone should have grabbed... Because what, what you've noticed... Have you, has anyone noticed that every player that's come out... 
Uh, Choco Williams said he shouldn't have said it. Del Santo mm. said he shouldn't have said it. So everyone that's been involved in the inner sanctum of a footy club has come out and said he shouldn't have said it. Know your role, play your role. David, that's not your role. How do you fix that now? Do you ask him to apologise to the players? How do you... Look, it's hard that? because, I don't, again, I don't want to be too critical of Dave because I wasn't there. Um, and, and the real... And the, and the re I'll answer it differently. The reason I wrote that down after a game, you can't take some things back. And I saw relationships being broken after games of footy um, by coaches specifically, but certainly other people... You can't take it back, and that's why I wrote it down, because if you don't stick to that philosophy... So, again, I don't know the words that he's used, but I hope that he didn't go overboard, because if he did, he can't take it back. That's there forever, and I don't care whether he apologises. Those words are there, and the players will, will remember those words. Thank you, Paul. Um, the appointment of Simon Goodwin. Can I ask you, number one, has he got your 25 points? <laughs> uh, and number two, what led you to uh, get him on board at Melbourne? Please, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I touched on the sort of coaching, um, you know, picking a coach before. We did it very differently, you know, and I believe in it. You know, what we did was a lot of informal discussions with coaches and coffees and just checking... You know, A, would they be interested? Um, we didn't go down the PowerPoint route because, um, unlike me, everyone else can do a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's fascinating actually watching PowerPoints now. They can put f flames coming up. It's really cool, you know, if you can do it. I can't do it. But some of them are really cool with the I flames. I can't do them either, so... Yeah, it's people okay. run across the screen yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So they don't, really, they don't really impress me from a coaching point of view, but... Visually, they look really cool. Um, so we didn't do any of that. What we did is, you know, rang around our contacts, tried to find out what made people tick, what was really important. So I didn't know Simon. Uh, we met with him at Todd Viney's house, myself and uh, Josh Marnie and Todd, and he didn't really talk a lot about game plan. He talked about building relationships and he talked about behaviours. He, he worked with Adelaide under Neil Craig. Neil Craig was very strong on leading teams, the behaviours, et cetera, et cetera. So when I walked out of there, um, yeah, I was really convinced that this was a guy that understood about leadership and understood what makes players tick. And then we got on to the next stage of presenting to the board, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that's the way, you know... Yeah, look, you never know whether they're going to be successful because it's a big jump from being an assistant coach to a coach. Um, and sometimes when they get in the position, you know, they freeze or they find it really difficult. But I think Simon's had a fantastic season, winning 12 games and proved that he's, you know, a good coach. Pressure goes more on him next year, clearly, but you know, I think he'll handle the pressure because he's got the fundamentals um, of, the, of the job right. <laughs> One thing that uh, people here may not know about your career was your involvement with the Players Association. You were a delegate, and I think even on the executive during the 90s, and that was at a time when uh, the Players Association turned from Paper Tiger to something a lot more, and you played a big role in that. Can you tell us a little bit about those years? Yeah, well, that sort of goes back to in my early days at Fitzroy, actually. So my, the early delegates and the pioneers of that were Laurie Serafini, um, Michael Moncrief, who played with Hawthorne, Simon Madden, who played with Essen. I remember back in the early 80s, we actually weren't even allowed to meet at the footy club. We actually had to meet across the street from the Junction Oval under a tree. Um, <laughs> And, and then it, I think at one stage we're going to boycott the pre-season competition <laughs> and the club got a bit shirty about that. Um, yeah, so it was probably early early 90s when I was captain of Fitzroy, I think, was the defining moment. There was a massive meeting at uh, the Carlton Crest Hotel. I'm not sure what it's called now, but it's on the, um, on the lake there. It was probably the first time the majority of players all turned up the meeting. Every single captain was there. And it was a sort of line in the sand moment for the, the Players Association when the AFL finally heard from the whole player group and every single captain was represented. And that was probably what springboarded the, the Players Association to the yeah, enormous power base that they have now. But it was certainly a, a massive struggle. And Peter Allen, who is a good, was a good friend of mine, unfortunately passed away. He was incredible in... Yeah, being a great pioneer of the players and, and his work uh, was just amazing to keep that you know, thing afloat because at, at certain stages in the late 
late 80s, early 90s even, it looked like it was going to you know, disappear. And as I said, that was a watershed meeting for the, for the Players Association. Do you think the players have too much power now or can they never have enough? <laughs> I think they've lost sight of some of the things. I do get a bit frustrated with the players. I, I think they've lost sight of some of the things. And to be fair to the players, I don't think they're entirely represented. I've got to be careful what I say because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've spoken to players individually and they don't necessarily agree with a lot of the Players Association, um, the things that they do. Um, and I think some of the players get frustrated that the Players Association don't come out more often and and thank the fans and, and say what a great environment it is. And, you know, and I think... I mean, you guys are the fans. I think people get sick of hearing about... Paul Marsh coming out and saying we want a percentage of salary, we want more money and, and I directly said to him at one stage, I said, Paul, you've got to be careful we don't lose the PR battle. Mm. You know, I'd love to hear you on the radio say how lucky these players are, how fortunate they are. These players, and I'll, I'll ask you, how many, how many people in the room would apply for a job that gives you 10 weeks off a year, a day and a half off a week, uh, they get a bye during the season, they get a bye going to the, the final, they get two long weekends after, four day breaks after the Christmas break and their average salary is $300,000. How many would apply for that job? <laughs> it's not a bad job. Mm -hmm. They do put their bodies on the line and oh, they have I, to live I, in a fishbowl. The bowl. other side of it, I, yep. I, I mean, I was a pioneer of it. Yep. All I'm saying is there's got to be a balance. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to hear the other side of it. I think too often we hear the side of we yep. want more, we want more. And it, but, but to be fair, as I said, it's not really reflective of no. the players. Of all players, yep. Yeah, you know, some of the players I spoke to at Melbourne, you know, were, were really disappointed in some of the stuff that was coming out of the Players Association. Um, so the majority of the players do. What I'm saying is I love yep. to hear it come from... From them. From them directly. Mm -hmm. Because the players are really appreciative of the clubs and appreciative yep. of the fans, and a, but we just don't hear it from the Players Association. Mm -hmm. um, tackling, Paul, um, I just find tackling just over the top now, watching it and going to the games and that, I just find it just too much. Is there any way of limiting the tackling that's going on now or do you think you can see it changing? Because it has changed over the years. Yeah, well, the tackling's changed because the Laws of Game Committee came in and changed all the rules, like... 15 years ago and they keep changing the rules and to try and stop the congestion which then adds to the congestion then they change the rule again which adds more congestion then they change the rule again which adds more congestion and more confusion then they change the rules again and then the umpires have got no idea how to umpire the game <laughs> so in my view get rid of the laws of the game committee get rid of them tomorrow give the and we talked about yep. it karen backstage mm -hmm. The umpires are full-time, as in Peter Schwab, the umpires advisor, Hayden Kennedy, they're full-time. Let the full-time people dictate the rules. Stephen Hawking's going to take over from Simon Lethleen. He's going to be full-time AFL administrator of the game. Let the umpires dictate what the rules are going to be. Don't have these part-timers coming in. And I'm not being critical. I mean, they're great people. I think Lee Matthews is on it. But it's, that puts them in a difficult position. It's like the old chairman of selectors. Who remembers the chairman of selectors? You know, he used to come in one day a week and pick the team. But that was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a chairman of selectors now. It feels so reactive, a lot of the rule It's changing. all reactive. You know, why did they bring in the rush behind rule? Because one game, which was the grand final between Hawthorne, I think Hodgie stepped through the goals maybe four times. Mm -hmm. So we've got to change that rule. You know, so they're so reactive, which makes it so hard to umpire. I, what, and when it dawned on me, it was, I was still coaching Sydney and I turned on Fox footy and there was an old State of Origin game that was, was on. The umpire basically blew the whistle as soon as someone got tackled, wasn't worried about a stoppage, blew the whistle, ran, literally ran into the stoppage, picked the ball up. The ruckman barely had time to get there let alone the, the two high half forwards and the half backs that we see now, picked it up, threw the ball in the air. What do you see now? One player gets tackled, the umpire doesn't want to blow the whistle to call a stoppage, the ball spills out. By the time it spills out, two other people have arrived, someone's picked it up, someone's tackled him, correct me if I'm wrong, the ball fumbles out again, two other people have arrived then. So by the time that the umpire then blows the whistle for a stoppage, how many people are at the stoppage? Already 10 or 12 people are at the stoppage because of the rules. So they've created this mess 
because of the laws of the game committee and, and how reactive it's they are to the, to the rules. The thing that I got from your book is that you see it as a very simple game. It, it's a and simple game. I yeah. feel like as a spectator, everybody's making it much more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah, look, I mean... I think I mean I think tackling is always going to be part of the game, but the more numbers around the ball, the more tackles you're going to you're going to have. And I think where I I like tackling and I like the physicality, and I don't get worried about I don't worry about scoring. Like if it's a great game, I mean the West Coast game versus Port game was a fan, did anyone disagree? That was a fantastic game of football. It was a low scoring game. It was a fantastic game of football. What I get frustrated, so I don't worry about the scores, but what I get frustrated is when a player gets tackled and the umpire doesn't blow the whistle for, for a holding a ball, free kick or a ball up. Then the ball spills out and there's four other tackles, five other tackles. If they had blown the whistle initially and thrown the ball up, then the game would... But the AFL reacted to the stoppages to try and create stoppages. So... In, instead of having stoppages, what do we have? We have melees. We just have these group of players. Well, I would rather see a stoppage. I would rather see the umpire come in, ball the ball up, and because you know what stoppages do, and, and I'll talk as a coach now, stoppages is a time where you can reset the ground because what happens if the ball's always in motion is everyone gets really messy and, and players, where do you think players want to gravitate to? The ball. The ball. Doesn't matter. You go and watch an under-11 game. The kids that start... <laughs> you go and watch an under-11 game or an under-10 game. What happens? you got 30 kids running around trying to find <laughs> the ball. And if the game doesn't stop for a stoppage, you watch a game of football because players naturally gravitate to the ball. At a stoppage, I guarantee what coaches are trying to say most of the time, get the forwards back. We want the forwards back. So it is a t chance to set the ground. So if you don't have stoppages, you have this messy game of football that, that has evolved over the years because of the rules and because of the way the umpires... I feel sorry for the umpires, Karen and I were talking about it. It's such a hard game to, to umpire because we've made so many rule changes over the years. And you guys, the fans, I don't know how, how you feel about it, but it is frustrating when you go to the football and half the crowd's yelling ball, half the crowd's yelling, so that's holding the ball, <laughs> dropping the ball. Is that No one really knows it now when you go to the game what the free kick's for, do they? We have gone well over time in our final quarter, but I do have one final question. It is September, so who wins it all? Well, it's, it, it's funny. I mean, I, I thought Adelaide and Sydney were the two best teams, but they're going to play in the preliminary mm. final, so both of those teams can't get in. The romantic... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, I said they're the two best teams, so they can't play in the grand final. <laughs> so they're on the same side. So they can't play in yep. the grand final. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> That's a Geelong supporter yep. down the back. I don't know. I think Geelong can win. I said that to Karen back mm. there. I mean, I don't think they will, but if, but if you look at. No, but. I, as I said, football is a random game. So if I sit here now and you tell me, you say, who are the two best teams? Adelaide and Sydney's best is the two best teams. If Geelong play their best game and Sydney play their best game, Sydney will win nine out of ten times. So Geelong will rely on Sydney not playing well. That's why we play the games. We play the games mm -hmm. because there are random events that happen in the games, injuries, poor form, etc. Can Geelong win? Absolutely. If Sydney play their best and Geelong play their best, they can't win. So if you're asking me now who are the two best teams, it's Adelaide and Sydney, mm -hmm. but they can't play in the grand final. Um, I think the winner of that game, if Sydney get to that <laughs> stage, um, should win. Who do I want to win? Richmond. Oh. You've... Oh, I just think it's... You've shocked me, Paul. I'm shocked. No, I just think... I mean, I hope John Longmire's not watching. No, but it's, it's funny because we're football fans as well, you know, like mm -hmm. coaches, players, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, like, I, last year I watched the Swans play the Bulldogs in the grand final. It was a no-lose for me because if the Swans win, clearly, you know, it, it's fantastic and I love the Swans to win. Mm -hmm. But then if you put your neutral hat on mm -hmm. and if you're looking at from the the welfare of the game and where the game's heading. You know, it's what we did in, in 05. And I'm, I'm sure yeah. John, as disappointed as John would, would have been, 
you know, a month down the track, you, you look at it from a, a helicopter view and you say, well, at least we got beaten by the Bulldogs. Yep. Yeah, because he was with, you know, John was very much part of the coaching group in 05, won it in 2012. So as much as I'd love to see the Swans win it, yeah, if you're looking at where Richmond have been and how Damien Hardwick has, con you know, has conducted himself and, and you know, 80,000 80, fans on Friday night, who went to that game? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's incredible to see Richmond fans. So and they're look, up and about. Yeah, Sydney, obviously, from a from a you know, heart point of view, but if you take your, you know, the, the neutral view of um, the Tigers, it's pretty exciting for, for Melbourne, you know, as a, as a city... Mm -hmm. You know, when Richmond are up, up and about. Um, so, long-winded answer to the question. <laughs> um, who was going to win it? You'd like to see I still, Rich... I still think Sydney or Adelaide will win it. But you still think Sydney's the best team in it? I still think Sydney's best is the best, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Adelaide played fantastically well. Mm -hmm. The only challenge for Sydney, you know, is clearly when you're at that stage, you can't afford to lose a game, you know. now, But now it's sudden death for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um so for the Geelong fans, who's, how many Geelong fans are in the room? <laughs> yeah, they, you can win, but you better hope Sydney don't play their best. <laughs> Paul Roos, thank you so thank much. You I think much we could have stayed Thanks here all night. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.